So we have a great program lined up to update you on all of these issues and more. Aside from the topics that I've already mentioned, you'll hear Charlene Weisler talking to both Nielsen and Comscore about the latest status of their efforts to develop cross-platform measurement systems. And we'll close the day with a look towards the future as uh, Shelley Palmer will help us to understand that the media environment today is the least complex that it will be going forward. <laughs> The brave hearts can stay for the, the last talk. Um, anyway, note that the bios, just a few little details, all the bios for all the presenters are in your packets, and uh, all presentations will be available on the SIM website as soon as we can get them up there, as well as a video. And I also encourage you to follow SIM on Twitter to keep up with all our initiatives throughout the year. And please finally silence uh, any electronic uh, devices as well. So to get started, it's my pleasure to kick off today's program with an esteemed panel of industry leaders moderated by Alan Wurzel, President of Research and Media Development at NBC Universal. These panelists are going to let us know how they are continuing to buy and sell media in a world where we don't have all the cross-platform measurement tools in place, but we still need to do business. And also how they're moving into a world of data-driven buying of media audiences alongside these big integrated packages of premium content. Come on up, Alan. Let's welcome Alan and his panel. Well, come on. No, no. We're among friends. Wow, so uh, here we are, the fourth annual SIM cross-platform summit. And I warn you that we're going to keep having these until we get it right. <laughs> so hopefully we won't be at the 16th, because you know, we should go to the Super Bowl uh, Roman numeral. But I, I have to say that the, um, the attendance here is amazing. I mean, I've, I've been to all of these, and I don't think I've ever seen so many people. And I think it, it actually reflects you know, how important this stuff has really become. And uh, what you're going to hear, as Jane said today, is a lot of folks talking about the ways in which the industry is trying to crack the cross-platform code. But we don't have it yet. And yet, we have to continue to do business. And so what we thought would be interesting before we began um, you know, to look and see what the future would be, to take three really significant executives from the industry and ask them how they're approaching what they have to do like next week as the upfront opens up and in the near term future in dealing with um, all of what's going on and the disruptions and the way people are consuming media and the way you're buying media, uh, but without having true cross-platform measurement. So let me just introduce the panel. Um, here is Fernando Ariola. He's the VP of Media and Integration at ConAgra Foods. And he'll be giving us a perspective from the marketer client. Next is uh, Linda Iaccarino, the Chairman of Advertising Sales and Client Partnerships at NBC Universal. And uh, last but not least is Aaron Matz, the Chief Marketing Officer of Analect, to give us an agency perspective. So what we thought we'd do is just to go around and just ask people a couple of fast questions first. Then we'll have a conversation. But honestly, you guys showed up. And I know the lunch was very compelling. But really, what's <laughs> more, more important, well, I know the drinks are more compelling, but what's more important <coughs> is the opportunity to sort of have a dialogue. So I'd like to uh, leave some time where we can have some you know, Q&A. So um, let me just start with the content. So Linda, l let me go to you first. How do you intend to approach this up front? And is NBC Universal going to do anything differently this time than they've done in the past? Well, I'm most concerned about what you asked me was that the up front was next week, and I hadn't planned on that. Two weeks. So, so oh, phew, <laughs> All right, I had to change things. Um, well, what are we planning on doing differently? <coughs> I, we have, there's a lot of things going on. I mean, imagine our, our company um, it has so many um, assets that we distribute tons of content on. Whether we make that content or acquire that content, we have so much of it, which is great. So what we're, we're really doing differently um, this year, I could say maybe it's more, that we're actively pushing content to every single platform and promoting in that way. So we're talking about our content a little differently. So as in the past where we might want to just stick with you know, the live viewing, you know what? We want to keep up with consumer behavior, even though measurement hasn't. We want to try to push that to where the consumer wants it anywhere, anytime. Um, that being said, 
it creates a couple of uh, maybe near-term uh, challenges, but that we've turned into some uh, opportunities. For example, with uh, CNBC uh, for our business day programming, come fourth quarter, uh, we are will no longer be relying on uh, Nielsen for a C3 rating, and we've moved on to a different metric that actually captures the people, the consumers who are watching the content. So that's one example to say if we can't rely on the limitation that we have now, as we all in this room trying to work together to catch up to consumer behavior, we're asking our clients to um, partner with us and, and be a little um, uh, brave with us in saying, okay, you know what? The consumer behavior or performance isn't all about a C3 rating. Well, C3 is a great organizing mechanism to this crazy giant business that we do. I won't be able to tell you the key KPIs you're looking for. So we're bringing a bunch of data products along with our partners at Comcast to be able to help us with the, being the company that has the most content in the entire marketplace, convince you and prove to you that I helped you sell more product than anyone else. And that really lives beyond the world of a um, C3 rating. And I know that you guys talk a, little, a lot about the APT, the audience uh, you know, targeting. Can you give us a little sense of what that's going to be? Um, a audience targeting platform. Um, really what we have developed, I, I think in layman's terms, we can call it a um, optimization tool. So we'll be able to pitch our clients that says, um, we take a, a, a bunch of new data sets, okay? So we have set-top box viewing that is matched with a variety of other consumer data sets, whether it's first party data or data that the customer would share with us, or first party data from NBC Universal that might be Fandango data. So we're able to combine that, uh, those bunch of data sets with set-top box viewing, uh, run it through the platform, apply it to all of the NBC Universal networks. So it's the broadcast network in English, we have Telemundo, which is Spanish, all of the cable entertainment, news, sports, so we'd able to apply um, the data matches to our planning system and give our clients a optimized media plan. So the key thing to think about is that right now, with the upfront, I guess, in two weeks, Alan, um, we're gonna do business kind of the same way we've done business for a bunch of years. But once we get for our customers that choose to participate, we will um, allow a revision or an update to the optimization of the plan to make the inventory work harder. And we're making this available for about 30% of the inventory across the portfolio. So you can imagine a, a, a portfolio of our size, 30% is a lot, but we needed to have, I needed to have kind of like a little slush fund of inventory available that I could morph and iterate on the plans if your plan came back and you said, you know what? I need less of USA, more Bravo. I need less voice, more NFL. And we need to be able to be nimble to be able to do that. So you'd be able to iterate at least once a quarter, but based on when the data matches come back. So we wanted to make sure that there's you know, uh, a, a shared vision that we think we know where the marketplace is going. As we move towards behavioral guarantees or audience selling, we needed to make sure that um, we pushed the TV industry forward in doing that. And one of the other unique offerings is that it's at program level data. So it's not these broad day parts that you're doing, that you're actually able to look at the selling day part and the program itself of what works better so you, we can convince our clients that they can sell more stuff. So that's the most exciting thing that we have in terms of data products um, out there in the marketplace. And we announced it. I think mid-January-ish, and it has been incredibly well received. So, Fernando, from the point of view of the, you're the client, you write the check, or, you know, how are you going to be approaching this up front? Any different than you have in the past? Uh, a lot of similar themes to, uh, to what Linda said. Um, we, we, so I think one of the interesting things about being at ConAgra, we have a lot of different brands and a lot of different um, objectives for those brands. Um, some are big brands, big penetration businesses that don't need to be as targeted. Others have to be highly targeted just because they're very low penetration and they're more of a surgical strike. But the interesting thing is they can learn, like the, we can share the learnings across with all the different brand managers. So I would say our approach, and it's kind of the, the general approach we've taken um, overall, 
we're definitely not on the bleeding edge when you look at some of our CPG peers who are um, pretty far ahead and, and, and pretty out there. They have um, higher margin businesses. They can invest a little bit more. Um, we tend to evaluate things, and then once we, ha we have a high degree of confidence that something works, then we'll reapply it further within the organization. So we are doing a lot of things that are similar to what Linda was talking about, which is, <coughs> hey, if we, ha if we can go out to um, a, uh, a consumer with multiple messages and optimize against those messages, obviously that's going to help us a lot. And I, I, an example of um, just for this room that will make it, you guys will be more familiar with this, is if you take a brand like Egg Beaters, we used to say we have one monolithic message for Egg Beaters. Everyone remembers Egg Beaters is all about low cholesterol, right? Okay, now you look at Egg Beaters, there's a yellow segment, and there's a white segment. The yellow segment tends to be pe people who are health conscious, but it's more around cholesterol. The white segment uh, tends to be a younger consumer. Those folks are interested in protein. They both care about calories, but how can we segment those messages to the right consumers so that we can optimize the business plan for egg beaters? So depending on the business, we're trying to do more targeting consistent with what uh, Linda's saying, or we're also using a fair amount of legacy tools. We'll still be buying age and sex for a long time, I think the mix will shift over time, though. You know, it's very interesting that you bring this up, because in a lot of the philosophical debates that we had at our company in developing ATP, we used a similar analogy when you talk about the two different kinds of consumers for egg beaters. I'm going to steal that when I go back to the office. We talked a lot about the need today to present television content in a way where it was kind of a serial analogy. Years ago, it was about either the celebrity on the box or the toy that was inside. But now it's all about is it protein, is it high fiber, or the, the kind of value points or the nutrients inside it, so the consumer is looking at it differently, and that's the way we wanted to approach the development of the ATP, because we really feel that, you know, it's kind of check the box with the scale of the NBC Universal portfolio. No one ever argues the power or the efficacy of video, but it's now about what more can you offer, or how better can you talk about what it is so that's very interesting. And optimize on the fly, depending on yes. who's reacting to what. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think you guys are in love. I, I think so. <laughs> I, this is I, this not the dating game? It's not yet. Not. Okay. Give us 15 minutes. Eric. <laughs> yeah. So you've got a whole bunch of clients, and you, they entrust you with a lot of money. Um, how are you going to approach this up front, knowing that really we don't have cross-platform measurement yet? Well, there's nothing like a billion dollar upfront to push the agenda yeah. on the uh, data and analytics side of things. So I'm particularly excited about all of the you know interesting things that NBC Universal is pushing uh, on, and um, you know I think we are approaching it in the same very much the same fashion, which is um, different parties are coming to the table this year than they ever did before. Mm -hmm. um, you're getting the insights folks at the table, you're getting the data and analytics folks at the table, along with the TV buyers and the video buyers, et cetera. So it, it becomes a much more diverse group of folks. Um, talking about how we're negotiating in those upfront conversations because there are products that are data-driven products um, and that's how we're, how we're approaching it a little bit differently in that we're bringing in different kinds of brains and different kinds of thinking in terms of how we, we, we deliver value back to clients in the upfront. So, I mean, you know, I'm, as a research guy, I'm always frustrated that we still, I used to say, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't sell it, you can't evaluate it and all that. But it sounds like Nobody here seems to be particularly crazed that we haven't cracked the cross-platform code yet, or is that not true? We're all just very zen about it. It's you know we, we've we've got we've gotten over it. But no, I, of course it's still you know a very uh, a very hot topic. And um, I think one of the things that we've learned over the last you know year or two is that um, in order you know it's it's a big problem to solve. Um, and one of the things that we've been building is a data infrastructure. Uh, within our agency that we think is going to help us get to that ultimate point of nirvana that we're all looking for, which is cross-platform measurement. Um, and I think that was a big aha moment for us um, in realizing that um, it, not, it isn't necessarily going to be um, a magic you know, model that's going to get us there. There are data and, tech and technology uh, infrastructure needs that we need to be building, um, both for ourselves on behalf of our clients, yes. um, in order to make that happen. So. Um, that was a, a sort of a, an interesting step change for us internally in realizing that we had to build some things in order to uh, eventually achieve that cross-platform measurement. So well, back in the day, there was this sort of common currency and everybody you know, said the same thing. It was the same ruler and all that. It sounds to me like everybody here is basically trying to figure out some proprietary way 
to kind of do things that right now the currency doesn't do. I mean, Linda mentioned CNBC, which is notable. Um, how far do we go with this proprietary stuff? I mean, does it work in a business of transaction? Does everybody trust each other that the data that the seller is showing is true or the bot? I mean, how, you know, how, how far can we take proprietary research? I think it's going to probably vary by industry, I think. So one of the big, big things that we always talk about at ConAgra is if you have um, financial services or travel um, that have a, or an online conduit where you can buy and sell, you have one-to-one -one data, you can get really granular about your consumer. We don't have that because we obviously sell through grocery stores and big boxes and dollar stores and stuff like that. So I think um, there is, it is going to differentiate based on how much information people have and kind of also what the purchase cycle is. So obviously if you're going to you know, buy financial services, that's a lot bigger risk than you know, buying a can of tomatoes. So I do think that there will probably, things will change over, over, over the course of time. And, and I think you're right in that data is going to drive a lot of that. And, and the proof or the efficacy of what you do, there's going to have to be some trust in the early days. Because it is early days, there's a lot of new tools, so it's hard to predict um, what the outcomes will be. But uh, you know what we are constantly asking our customers to do, um, because to your point, a lot of what limits television, let's say networks or sellers right now, is technology and infrastructure. No one wants to be handcuffed by these limitations of what a C3, and if you can't get to multi-platform measurement, which I am much less zen about, that um, if we can't get there, then we have to trust each other. We have to have, be able to sell a program to a client that's absolutely, we know it's reaching a consumer, but you know what? Maybe you have C3 or C7 for linear television, but you know what? VOD, day four and beyond, we have to then be able to trust and agree on a different type of measurement. If we look at what's out there, whether it's in terms of mobile or tablets, or whatever you, kind of agreement you're going to get to for this multi-platform measurement, then we have to be a little more flexible or creative in what, how we look at what those guarantees are. And I think data will drive it, and I also think proof and ROI. And I do feel one of the things we talk about a lot at NBC Universal we're willing to take on more of that risk. It's our responsibility to push and to say, we want you to trust us. We're going to deliver this to you. So we'll, let's talk about some different KPIs or some guaranteed ROIs on it. Because otherwise, we're just going to be stuck here for a long time. And we're trying to move it forward. So, so Erin, when, when Linda and her colleagues come to you with all of these focaccia, you know, different things. Focaccia. And that's a research I'm Italian, term, Alan. Way. I don't ever <laughs> use that word. Uh, <laughs> Like, how do you explain to your I mean, I guess clients know what a CPM is. They know what an impression is. How do you explain to them the various kinds of ways in which measurement is now moving? So uh, many of our clients are, are actually pretty savvy about the you know, ins and outs of measurements and the challenges associated with that. Um, and we have a huge learning and development uh, initiative at Omnicom that helps our <coughs> clients get there and certainly helps us internally get there as well because it's a very dynamic space. It's changing all the time. We love our acronyms and we like to throw them around <laughs> like party favors. So it is important to keep up at the very least with the language associated with this and all of the different products that are, are, that are coming out. Um, and I would say you know, we're, we are the you know, front lines to um, negotiations with our clients, but our clients are, are holding our hands at, at that point too. I mean, they're very much involved and um, many of our clients are very passionate about this. Um, so I, I think there's, um, you know, certainly some challenges, uh, but we would like to bring them along for the ride. Fernando, when you go to your CMO and say, I'm going to be buying based upon Nielsen and, you know, one of these proprietary, do you get any kind of pushback there or? No, we're actually pretty fortunate. Our CMO um, is completely receptive to letting us fail as long as we learn from other failures. So she is really um, into us bringing alternate ways of doing things because she feels like eventually it's going to move everything forward. And who knows, sometimes you hit it right out of the gate. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what we're pursuing, we've per, since I've been at ConAgra, we've been doing varying level, various levels of purchase-based targeting. So basically saying, instead of buying women 25 to 54, we're going to buy people who buy all beef hot dogs. Um, and basically getting data from um, the retail partners like Dunhumby Data or Walmart or um, Data Logics. Um, those, those guys help us with that kind of thing. And um, it's, it, it tends to work pretty well. Well, that brings up a really interesting point. So, the industry for its 70 years or whatever has been based essentially on demographic ratings. Do you guys think that that, is, that future still exists or do you feel that that's going to basically 
begin to, to, to wait, I mean, to become less important going forward. I, I think if we take the digital space as any indicator and, and think of it as sort of like a practice round for, for television, um, I would say that we are going to get more and more precise in the way that we target, um, which is only going to be a benefit to everyone here uh, on stage and, and in the room. Um, uh, because we can get better about that message delivery. I, mean, I think the egg beaters example was great. We, we work with a, a QSR um, for whom segmentation um, somehow means limitation to them. And you know, they need to get you know, 30 million people into their retail locations every single day. Um, and segmentation somehow means you might be not spending that media, those media dollars against those audiences. And what we're talking about instead is smart reach, which is don't deliver the, um, a hamburger message to someone who only drinks coffee and only drink, goes to your location to drink coffee. Get better about that message delivery. Um, still spend the money that you need to spend in order to get 30 million people into your locations, um, but do it in a smarter way and use data to inform that. I agree with um, Aaron. I, I do think that the days of demo targeting alone are pretty quickly coming to an end. And data is the thing that's driving that. You know, when, when I was coming up in the business um, years ago, uh, it was what we used to call psychographics, right? And it was always kind of like an underlying goal, but it was never a guarantee, it was never talked about. And now it's become behavioral. And the data is driving the ability to actually capture but prove mm -hmm. that you reach them. I think that proving the reach, that efficacy in digital world is still being played out. Right, But we know that when in the right context, the marriage between premium video and an advertiser's message, that, that marriage, that's where the magic happens. And if we're able to, I like what you said, I might steal that sometime, the practice round for television, um, that if we're able to take that audience-based targeting and get better at me refining um, Conagra's media plans and be able to prove that it compelled the consumer to do something, that's what we're all trying to get to. And that's certainly what um, NBC Universal is trying to push the marketplace towards. I think the, uh, I'm smiling, Aaron, my partner is in the audience over there, and I think about how many brand managers go to you and say, we want to target women 35 to 54. So I don't think that the demographic um, uh, agent sex is going away anytime soon, but it is changing. I think to your point, I think it's evolving. Um, and I think the conversations are really interesting. A couple years ago, so I use the egg beat as an example. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch gears and talk about popcorn. So how many people in this room eat pop? How many people have eaten popcorn in the la you know, last year here? Probably a lot, right? So, and, and we had this conversation with this popcorn brand manager once, and it got fascinating, because they said, hey, we've identified that our optimal target is um, moms with kids and families and stuff like that, and they had done some volume against it, and so we said, okay, we, we, we think we can surgically strike that target with this, which suddenly we started talking about, and they're like, well, older people won't see the messaging then, and they started getting nervous, and then little kids aren't gonna see the messaging then. And there's this whole notion, because the popcorn guys always talk about they want people to go to the grocery store to buy it, but they also want the kids to bug their parents at home to make it. And so it got into a really interesting conversation on how narrow do you want the target to be? Because we also get into these conversations about point of market entry. Mm -hmm. You may not be a current user, but boy, the minute that baby comes out, now you're buying diapers, right? And so there's like some really interesting dynamics. Once you start talking to the brand people about targeting too narrow, they get really nervous if they feel like they're gonna miss out on some business. Because like in that popcorn example, even if very few senior citizens are, 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 are eating the popcorn or very few kids are badgering their, their parents, even if it's less than 10%, that still could be a big, big um, nut for those guys. Yeah, so it's an I interesting think dynamic. That's the, the, the dilemma or the thing that, that it's still playing out early days because Having all the big data is great, but then you sit there and say, well, what the hell do I do with all of it? And it's the conversation you get into, which is the top of the funnel brand of what you're talking about. You're afraid to not get anyone, and you need all those big, giant buckets of GRPs, but then the bottom of the funnel point of purchase. Yeah. So you gotta figure out how to balance both of those. And I think that's really gonna play out uh, over time of what's the right balance between TV and digital, and what's the role and then what's digital? Is it social, which is an extension of you know, what, 
what the, the video core is. So, so that's what you, that, that's a tough job to have because you're balancing that brand awareness with, you know, they're at the store and they're going to buy it now. Well, are we making a mistake saying TV and digital, or should we talk about redefining television? I mean, in other words, is this all television and, and it gets measured the same way, or, or what do you guys think? Yeah, I, you know, there, there's definitely an argument for it's video. It is something I'm watching sight, sound, and motion on if it's on the big screen, if it's on my iPad, if it's on my mobile, whatever that happens to be. Um, and, and the, you know, I think we can learn from the initial stages of what we've done in the digital space that would help inform television. But, you know, I do want to acknowledge that television is its own, it is, it's its own beast. Um, do you care what platform, you know, Linda has a show, do you care if, if a consumer watches it on the big screen, on a tablet, or on a smartphone, makes no difference to you? Mm -mm. It, it is where, as long as that's where the consumer is and the, my right. desired consumer is. Um, and if I have that information, um, that's going to make our relationship that much stronger because, I, you know, I'm able to buy what I need. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the care factor really only comes in when we talk to our creative agencies and creative partners on how we're going to deliver and create and develop, you know, beautiful storytelling across mm -hmm. those different channels. And I think what gets really interesting is when you think about the sequential messaging opportunities that are, because of course we don't just have an iPad or just have our big screen television. Um, what happens when I walk into a room and you know catch a couple of minutes of one show and then go back into my bedroom and watch the rest of it on my iPad? You know, how do I manage that consumer journey? Well, assuming we can crack this technically, the, the cross-platform problem, what kind of metrics do you guys want to see? Basically, the same ones we have now, or I mean, you know, I think the guys here, this, this, that's what they're working on. What do you want them to deliver to you? Yeah, I, so f um, from our perspective, um, we measure brand health and sales. For brand health, um, we have a partner called Communicus, um, which helps us evaluate how our advertising is going. And they universally, they always come back. Um, they, they sometimes report different things for different brands, but they always say um, when consumers see um, the same branding message, three or more times, and it's not just three plus reach, but I'm like three, then that's hugely helpful. So I think to, to what we're talking about here, that the unduplicated, if we can maximize how many unduplicated people see the message, have three different encounters with the message, um, that's good. So that's definitely key. The second thing that's, that's important for us is the sales. And so we're, we're putting a lot of effort and energy into trying to say like, hey, if we have the, um, this, this out in the marketplace and we're optimizing against it, what approach is going to sell more, this approach or this pro approach. So both of those are pretty important. Well, you know, look, we're, we're in service to you and to, to, to your clients. What we talk about all the time is, is total audience delivery. So what we want to deliver is exactly what you said, is the, the consumer who sees it on their mobile phone or the next consumer who watches it on their tablet or watches it on the big screen. We just want to add them all up and say, these are the people who had an experience with your brand. Again, technologically, there's, there's limitations. And a unification or a consistency of metric is where we have to work through. right? I think if we have some proof of concept, we're going to be able to push the industry forward. Um, and, and as you look at you know, kind of the multi-platform experience, one thing I think you'll see that is certainly, unfortunately, it's 18 months from now, but when you think about the Rio Olympics, right? That is going to be a cross-platform bonanza. And, and could, since it'll be the first live Olympics in many, many years, that really what we, our researchers estimate it to be the biggest viewing event in the history of television. Now, I say television, but I say television that's going to be consumed on a variety of different tablets. When we were in London four years ago, or, or um, almost four years ago, the iPad was brand new. Barely anyone had it. So we don't know how people are really going to consume it. So I think that's really going to, we're building towards that um, about what it is. So, so total audience uh, uh, measurement is what you know, we're really pushing for. Because when we look at, when we talk about TV versus digital, you know, most of our, whether it's on an over-the-top device or different ways to access points, most television is consumed or content is consumed on a still a television, a television set. So we have to think that that's still driving it. We continue that it, to believe that it will continue driving it. And we're just building and trying to invest in infrastructure to, to push everybody. 
Erin, is there anything different that the, the buyers want? Uh, I mean, same sales, of course, and, and that's, um, you know, I, I think as a byproduct of that, what is the best proxy for sales? Um, that would help an agency optimize, and you know, if we can't get sales, what's the, the next closest thing? And that would be a variety of different metrics based on different kinds of client needs and, and what their objectives are. Um, you know, without, you know, I, I think um, more metrics are better. Um, part of what our job is is to wade through those metrics and find the one, you know, key performance indicator that is going to help drive sales uh, for popcorn or what, what have you. Um, so having access to you know, sort of a wide variety of different kinds of things that we could measure uh, would make our jobs easier as an agency partner because um, we want that freedom and flexibility to customize things for our clients. So you can't open up a trade without seeing the term programmatic. Can somebody explain to me what the hell that is? <laughs> uh, it's using data to buy uh, based on audiences. Well, don't we do that now? In a way, we do, um, but it is uh, more of a proxy versus a precise approach. So a proxy being you identify surrogates based on data to target your message. But I think programmatic um, means uh, several different things to people. So when people automatically use that P word, they think of you know kind of uh, bidding on inventory in a real time environment and the common most uh, uh, widely uh, wide assumption is that that commoditizes the inventory and it drives CPM down. Um, we don't necessarily believe that to be true, but there is, I think, a seat at the table for inventory that's readily available at most times. Like the way we think about it at NBC Universal, because we have such tremendous scale and we got a lot of networks and a lot of digital sites. I would love to sit here and say we're sold out all day, every day, but last time I checked, we are not. So, so we have, there's a seat at the table for that type of inventory. Technologically, you can do it all day long with, with display. You, there's not really a good automated mechanism to do video inventory today, but we're working on that. So again, I think it's a seat at the table thing, but then programmatic could also mean data-driven, audience targeting in something that comes in the form of like our audience targeting platform that we talked about earlier. It's as automated as it gets in all of television, but it's actually a, a what we would call um, a, a premium tool, but you're getting an effective CPM and not a regular old fashioned CPM. So there's a lot of different uh, definitions of what program programmatic is. The purest is data driven, enable our customers to make data-driven marketing decisions. At NBC Universal, you know, you got the regular programmatic that everyone, you know, kind of defines. That's absolutely real, um, and will get bigger for us over time. But then there's the, you know, we want to give our premium content choices to our advertisers, where they no longer have to decide between real time of digital and television. So, Fernando, any thoughts about programmatic? I think, these, I think these guys covered it off really well. Yeah, so like automated, data-driven um, execution. Yeah. So I, I want to get to the audience in a second, but um, I have just two questions. So, so Nielsen reports that the putts this year over year is off 17% among 18 to 24s. It's off 10% among 25 to 34s. And again, we're not talking about market share. We're talking about just the use of the television medium. Do you guys believe that? You know, we were uh, actually, it was funny, we were back there talking about our kids using TV. I think the, for the younger segments, I think the putts, I'm not exactly sure how Nielsen is measuring it, but I do think some of the stuff that we talked about with iPads and alternate viewing sources and so on and so forth, I think for that segment, they probably are. I think there's a lot of, I don't think that it's not, that they're not necessarily consuming the content, but I think the way Nielsen is measuring it is probably not capturing all the different apertures. Uh, yeah, the, I mean, the rent is really high in New York City, and every, you know, 22-year-old I talk to who's, you know, fresh out of college says that, well, I'm just going to get it, you know, online. You know, there's no reason for me to get that, except for live sports, and, you know, then I'll go to a bar and check it out. So I, I, I believe that as much as, you know, I, I you know, my, my focus group of, you know, the 10% of 22-year-olds that are coming into our company um, every month say. Um, you know, I do think that for good content, they are also willing to pay it. They grew up in the with the Apple iTunes model. You know, they don't they don't expect to buy the whole album. They want to buy the songs that they want. 
And so it's not a question of just, well, it's too expensive or you know, I can't, my cable bill is huge. It's just that I, I expect to get just the programming that I want. So I think that is more driving it rather than just sort of a, a big cable bill at the end of the month. I, I have younger kids. Um, so I have three girls, seven, nine, and 11. And um, they're watch, uh, they watch this show that's on Cartoon Network. They started watching on Cartoon Network. They never watch it on Cartoon Network anymore. They YouTube episodes on, on, and they watch it. And they actually YouTube it. Then they beam it to the big screen TV from their iPad so they can all watch it together. But I think about that. I'm like, they're YouTube. Who taught them that? <laughs> um, the oldest one, she's more Ask adept. Ask if they want to go to college. I know, right? She's more adept at this than I am. But it's incredible that they're still they're consuming that content, but they're just doing it in a completely yeah. different way. Yeah, and I think a um, couple of couple of comments. First of all, I, I do we believe it? I think there's enough data that shows that those numbers are extreme. So at our company, not particular to those demos, but I think the most recent things we talk about for 18 to 49 is that anywhere, depending on genre, a low end of 12% to something as high as with a piece of content like the blacklist can be under measured by 35%. So it's really hard to react to the headlines that call the demise of television when you know there's a core terrible problem that's not being paid attention to. And in all the press, I, I wait to read the headline. But it's not measured. It's not measured, but I'm hoping someone writes that. But to your point about um, you know, that they're watching TV differently, I think that's true. Um, I, I will say uh, my son just moved into his first apartment. And the first thing him and his two roommates did was buy two televisions, one on top of each other, not just because of his mom, <laughs> um, because I wasn't paying for anything, so he wouldn't care. But it was for sports. It was for some key programs that they watch. And thankfully, he has no money to go out to the bars, so he's not <laughs> drinking. Enough. But, um, but the, the, the choice of content is really important because they watch what they want to watch when they want to watch it. And that's why you know mobile is exploding so much. You can do with mobile, whether it's your iPad or the, the little screen in your hand. That Don't you think it's a little weird that your phone is now starting to get bigger? And it was getting smaller, now it's getting bigger again to watch the good content. But um, it also is impacting how companies like NBC Universal are developing content. So you, you may have heard, I talked about the Olympics earlier, we extended our contract to till 2032. For the reason that you bring up is that sports is sports. We have our contract, I don't know, 10 more years or so with the NFL because that's what drives people to the set. That's why we do things like we did this year with SNL 40, or we do the Sound of Music, or Coming Up with Wiz, because we create these events that, are tran that transcend generations and bring them to the set. We promote other product along, uh, along with that, but it's really important now. Measurement and technology actually is impacting content development or, uh, or programming licensing acquisitions to, to keep um, to keep the ecosystem alive. And it's really fascinating time. So let me just turn to the audience. Any questions or thoughts, comments, anybody? Yeah. Okay, you guys have been talking about customized targets going on and enriching data inside the larger big targets. Is it on? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Anyway, we, to repeat the question or the, or the background for it, um, you talked about the idea of enhancing TV audience information with uh, data that would enrich it and, uh, and, and enable you to get the true value out of it from an advertiser agency and media perspective. Um, what are your thoughts on the standardization of that and how it would be, let's say, audited? Uh, and you know, as each network or each agency has their special sauce, and that the special targets be, uh, transcend uh, from customization to uh, currency. How does that work? Any thoughts? Well, I could jump in from a TV network standpoint. We're incredibly frustrated by um, the confines of an established legacy currency. That's one size fits all. And we look with envy to the digital space where there is more <coughs> flexibility, creativity, because there isn't one currency, right? And you know, if Google keeps their data and Facebook keeps their data and they're gonna tell you what 
their, their um, performance was based on their data. We, I wouldn't say we aspire to get to that point, but we're frustrated by a legacy system that doesn't allow any of us to be, um, to be creative and flexible, but that's why we feel strongly at our company that we need to put a little more skin in the game and say, I'm willing to give you that KPI guarantee because please get me there. Let's do it once, let's try it. Invest more with us, we'll give you that uh, secondary commitment um, because we got to break out of it, so. I, I think Linda brings up a really good point about um, uh, in the digital space and, and beyond really uh, of um, platforms and, and publishers, you know, sort of um, closing themselves off into walled gardens and having the, you know, their own kind of customized uh, piece. We've struggled with standardization for a long time in the digital space, no, no question. Um, I think the role of the agencies um, can and should be to drive solutions that drive interoperability between those systems. Like when we look at um, Google, Facebook, yeah. um, you know, to some degree, uh, Microsoft, um, Amazon, it's, you know, we, we sort of affectionately call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? Because you can, <laughs> you can see a scenario by which they You didn't own. mean the television apocalypse, no. did you? <laughs> Just the general one. Um, <laughs> You know, they own the devices, they own the operating systems, they own the back-end data sets, they own the single source login, right? My Gmail login is different than my Amazon login is different than my Microsoft Xbox login. Those are enclosed systems. The content is really what is interesting about it that plays on all those different systems. As agency partners, we feel a responsibility to bridge those different systems and help drive as best we can some standardization, but at least drive connections between those systems because if we don't, then you're gonna be buying against four horsemen and that makes a very complicated space even more complicated. Another question? Yeah. Wait to wait for the mic, Sean. The rate of change continues to accelerate and there's a lot of work being done on cross-platform measurement as well as uh, programmatic Next year at this time, what do you think might be solved and what challenges might still be there? That's a tough one. <laughs> um, I, think more, I think more people will be further down the road with programmatic. Um, I think part of the challenges that we see out there is um, there are certain ways you can tag um, your execution. And um, now we've heard different rumblings from folks on the agency side of people are trying to jam all this stuff into tags. And some people will take certain tags. You talk about the wall gardens and others won't. Um, and it'd be awesome if you could. I mean, when you think about um, uh, that unduplicated exposure, I mean, a Nirvana somewhere down the road, I don't know where, would be if you could tag everything and you'd know who what had what kind of exposure. So I think there'll be more progress being made. But I don't think that uh, it seems like a lot of the issues um, are going to be challenging for a while. Um, I'll jump in a couple of things I think will make a lot more progress on, uh, number one, from a technology standpoint as it relates to television, or if you want to call it digitally delivered television, I think you'll see tremendous advancements in VOD and dynamic ad insertion. So because the market is much more ready for that, we're going to be confronted with talking about what is the right measurement or what's acceptable measurement now. So if DAI is going to become um, more and more uh, of a usable thing, and I urge you, it's really, there's opportunity there that the marketplace has not taken advantage of yet. And, and we're certainly ready to do that. And if you, if you look at or know, and I see some friends in the room, at, if you look at the more and more content is being populated in the VOD space. So there is advertiser opportunity that is virtually untapped. I think you're going to see a lot of it, and certainly a lot of it move um, for the upfront with our company this year. So, and it, it, it's driven by technology development. In terms of programmatic, I think um, it might take a little while longer because, particularly for television, it's really a technology hurdle. Uh, it, it's not. I think um, some media companies are, you know, not there yet. But I think it's more technological hurdles that disable us from populating video in a real, in the true sense of programmatic. But I would definitely keep an eye on VOD and DAI, not to use too many acronyms, but um, where, where our bets are and our investment money is going a lot into that space. So excited about that. You know, I think Linda brings up a really good point on what will change. And one of the things that we've kind of assessed over the past you know, five or six years 
is sometimes people are ready for something, sometimes people mm -hmm. aren't. Her point about VOD is really good because whenever new partners bring stuff to us, the first thing that goes through our head is, could our agency execute this given their existing infrastructure and how much would it cost if we had to change or how much, what other stuff would it slow down? And I do think that we're at a point, we just had a great meeting with our agency yesterday where the agency culture really is changing and I think the cultures are changing the people and I think that is gonna be a big difference versus I think it was more of a steady state before mm -hmm. and now people are like, we are in a constant state of change and that's the way we have to go to work. I think that would be my hope. I don't know if it's a prediction, but my hope is that um, it, you know, you see agencies, clients, you know, sellers, et cetera, um, not just you know, when, when you know, programmatic comes up in the conversation to say, oh, well, here's my digital person. Like, well, take it away, right, digital person, right. that everyone becomes uh, proficient at talking about this the, the, right, the same way and uh, feeling comfortable talking about a lot of this new technology and a lot of the data uh, infrastructure that's required. So we're just actually literally out of time. I'm very good, 55 seconds left. But let me just ask you guys a final question. It's multiple choice, okay? Oh God. I want to know when do you think we will see true cross-platform total audience measurement? Later in 2015, sometime in 2016, or the fifth of never? <laughs> I, you don't have to answer. These guys were great. Thank <laughs> you. I'm glad you changed your mind. Yeah. <laughs> you let us off the hook there. Thank you so much. I'll make a prediction. We might see some later in the program even. So um, thank you so much, Alan, Linda, Fernando, Aaron, for describing the current state of the industry and setting the stage for all the changes that are underway.